I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6.31. Um, we don't have a note taken today, so I guess we can just do minutes from the recording. Yep. Um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. Um, I'll make a motion to accept the agenda as written. Okay. Um, I think we will. Uh, we won't have um, for assigned times and timekeeper. We won't have a time limit for the board agenda items, but I think we will have a time limit for public comment, um, individual public comments. Um, so um, I, I'll go ahead and keep time for that. Um, all right. What, what is the current um, time that we allot for the public? I know at other board meetings it's three or five minutes. Or we have yeah, I think three minutes is what we've typically done um, when it seems like there's going to be significant comments. So um, I think we'll do that and limit the public comment at the beginning to a maximum of 20 minutes. Um, and then we'll um, have more comments at the end of the meeting. <clears throat> All right. Um, moving to the consent agenda. Um, we have a motion to approve the minutes of Tuesday, September 20th, 2022. So moved. I'll move. second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, minutes are approved. Okay, we'll move on to public comment. And before I do, I just want to um, say that the way this is going to work at, at the board meetings is the public gets a chance to speak and everybody can say what they um, have to say. As I said earlier, I'm going to limit it to three minutes per person. Um, and the board is going to listen. And then when we get to the agenda item, we'll discuss um, the comments from the public and at the end the, there will be another chance for the public to speak um, and I just ask that everybody keep it courteous and, and respect everybody's um, you know, positions on on the issue so um, we'll try and if, if somebody anybody wants to speak raise your hand and we'll try and um, go in order of what happens? What happens if the public comment isn't part of the already approved oh. agenda? So when would? Well, I think we can have the board comment. The board can speak to what the public says okay. during the board comment. Okay. Okay. Um, why don't we start with state your name and. Sure. So I get a little nervous. Um, my name is Kate Jarvis, and I moved to Bethel 17 years ago in 2005 and have raised all three of my daughters here since then. All three have attended Bethel and Royalton schools for over 17 years, starting in pre K with Miss Karen um, at the age of three. Although I'm currently residing in Woodstock, my two youngest daughters, who are currently 12 and 14, attend the middle school in Bethel and the high school here in Royalton. I'd like to start off by saying that I do not have an opinion on the locker room issue at hand um, and that I am a supporter of the LGBTQ plus community. I simply do not have enough knowledge as a parent and I'm sad to say that I think there are many parents who are in my same boat. Let me clarify though, this is not because we don't care, as some have recently said on public forums including members of our own school board. They've also stated that we can send our kids to private school if we're not happy with the board's current policies. I'd like to think that folks in the community, teachers and administrators who have known me for many years, most definitely know that I do care about my children and about all of our children, including those in the LBGTQ plus community. I may not know all of the proper pronouns or language that is to be used, but that is by no means a sign of disrespect or hatred. That's not who I am. The reason I felt the need to come tonight and to speak publicly is the recent public behavior by one of our local school board members. We elect and we vote for these members to bring our community together. We trust them to make important decisions 
regarding our schools and our children, to protect and advocate for them, all of them, to inform and communicate with members of the community, after which policies are passed. I'd like to share a few comments and or posts that have been made recently by school board member Shannon Morrill Cornelius. I've also printed these comments that are extremely concerning with no doubt bullying and hurtful to parents, students, children, and other members in our community. And I, I would say that some of them are explicit. I don't know if they're child rated. So before I read them aloud, I don't know. It's if okay, Kate, they're my kids. Okay. So let's see, on 1013, after posting numerous comments included in the handout provided, may I hand out so you have the handouts? Any objections? I can hand them if you want. Oh, ahead. I can get it. It's okay. Oh, thank thanks. you. Um, you may have to share because my work printer <laughs> was not going to allow multiple, multiple copies. It is getting close to the end of the three minutes. Well, I will do my best. And, and otherwise, you have all the attachments. Yeah, and you can also speak. I think I sent you a copy, right? And I'm just about finished, Andrew. Thank you. So on 1013, after posting numerous comments included in the handout on a public Royalton forum and in response to a news article that was shared about the recent incident in Randolph, Shannon posted to a public social media page, Chris Tutian. I will, um, just taught me a new term while reading the latest BS on the community forum from the transphobe trolls in town. He's just jacking off. Stands for assholes who keep coming at you with, but I just have a question. We have a few in this town who have jacked off so much over there, the forum is awash in their ejaculated quarries. I'm sorry, Shannon, that we as parents have questions. On 10-7, she posted, I'm not going to be pushed around anymore. I'm not going high when they go low and walking away. Standing up for something isn't a fault, and I am so over giving a fuck what the Trumpy white boys in this town think of me. I'm calling it out. Thanks. Um, okay. A post to Shannon's page, so in which she commented after. Sorry. You're... That's okay. May I finish? I have one more. Um, yeah, last one. By Courtney Collins, appreciation post for Shannon Morrill Cornelius who has absolutely destroyed, in all caps, a transphobic asshole on a local Facebook page. Let the record show that her voice prevailed. I have gorged myself on his pathetic male tears. Shannon loved and post and commented, the good news is history isn't written by the trolls, but by those who show up and do the work. Wait until he finds out I'm transitioning my career to teaching at the high school. Thank you. Um, but I think I have to include an action. I'm a concerned parent and I've spoken to concerned parents in the town. We ask that her board seat be <coughs> removed immediately. She is causing further divide and conflict and hatred in this community and it's not going to bring any resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else who's here in person like to speak at this time? I think uh, James Gothier. Um, I'm a resident of Royalton. I had two kids that came through elementary all throughout high school. Um, and I actually sent a, an email to the board this week. Um, there's been a massive debate on Facebook. Um, and I actually came tonight really just to ask if, if there's any possibility of clarifying. There's a lot of speculation and, and arguing that this is the board's policy, when in reality, I think that the board has taken Vermont state law, the best practices, and implemented what they say should be done. And I think if people understood that, if that is in fact the case, um, then really I think there's no question that the school is doing what's best under the law and doing what's best for every and all student. Um, you know, I, I really just wanted to come today to say that I support every single student in this community whether they be straight, whether they be transgender, however they identify. And that's the policy that I think the school is following. And as a parent, um, not of a current student, but two students got a great education here, I felt it was important to, to come and, and express support for my friends. I have a lot of friends who still have kids here, some who, uh, who identify in different ways. And, and I don't want them to read Facebook pages that make them feel like less of a person. Uh, and I can understand people have concerns from all sides, but I just think it's, it's about the kids. 
Thank you. Um, are there people online who would like to speak? Somebody, we have somebody who's raised their hand, but there's no name next to it. Agent. So they have joined using companion mode, so they're seeing the meeting take place with their camera and mic turned off. Okay. Okay. All right, is there any other public online or in person? I'm sorry, I cannot hear anything being said. Okay, sorry. That's okay. We'll try and speak up. Um, did you have anything you wanted to say? <coughs> okay. Okay, well, it sounds like we're through public comments at this time. Um, so everybody will have a chance to speak at the end. Um, so we'll move to board comment. Um, would any board members like to speak at this time? I'll just clarify that these are taken from my personal wall, not a community forum. And the one from a friend of mine, that's, that's a lot of digging that went into that. But also posted on her personal wall, not on a community forum. That's not, that's not that was the public forum comments. The, the one from Chris to Chinjin? No. In that packet, there are many public forums. Oh, I'm sure there are further down, but the ones you read were from my own wall, not from the public forum. There's many. They were, they were photographed and put in the public forum, not by me. There's many that speak about the school board there in the, those conversations. I never spoke for the school board. I can't speak for the school board, and I made that very clear. Hmm. I was speaking as a parent. We're bringing our concern to the board so they can consider it. That's, that's your prerogative. I agree. I'd like to make a comment, please. Um, in, in regard to the comment that these um, Facebook comments were not intended to represent the board, I, as a impartial observer, felt that they clearly were an intent to represent the board and to tell anybody that had a different opinion that it would not be taken into account. Um, I could probably pull up some of the, the uh, specific quotes, but I think they were given a little bit earlier and the word board was used many times. Uh, what was your name? Sorry, could you just state your name? Your name. Keith Bowman. Okay. Um, do any other board members have things they'd like to um, say? I had a, a board comment that didn't have to do with this um, topic, but, um, well, kind of, but not really. Um, so I had the, um, the opportunity to uh, visit Randolph last week when they had their uh, community discussion in regards to um, the transgender and gender non-conforming students and the incident that took place over there. Um, so I was just kind of curious and, and sat in to see the community's reactions and comments. And, um, uh, I guess some things that I, I mean, first of all, it's <clears throat> a very terrible for what all the students Randall Randolph had to go through or are continuing to go through there. It's a, it's a very big distraction on their part. I, there was lots of comments about <clears throat> um, students either not feeling safe at school or not wanting to go to school to learn because, and, and you know, and these were children that weren't necessarily directly impacted, but, um, and, um, you know, the, the amount of hate that, that it came to Randolph through you know, national media, there was comments about, um, you know, emails and phone calls and death threats and um, I think the SU page was, was um, well, SU and the high school pages were tampered with and they had to take them down. So, I mean, it was just um, terrible all around. Um, but some takeaways that I had there as a, a new board member was because it wasn't really I think there were questions that were asked from the community that weren't necessarily answered by the SU over there on, and I think one gentleman uh, here in the Army shirt, sorry, I forgot your name, James, yes, kind of elaborated to it was the difference between state law and SU policy. Um, 
So I got kind of thinking through that and, you know, just like any policy, at some point we should always revisit policy to see, you know, is the policy still um, giving us the desired result of when we put it in, right? Um, or has the policy, like we talked about with bullying and harassment at the last meeting, you know, has it been implemented in our schools? So in this case, you know, the, uh, in Randolph, there was a lot of privacy um, uh, concerns in regards to locker room, bathroom, and, and other areas of the school. So um, that was kind of my big takeaway is maybe, or what I would suggest for the board is that we, we do revisit the, um, the policy as well as uh, put some time into seeing how that policy currently has been implemented in our schools um, for the privacy of all of our students. Because um, I would just, I mean, I would hate for any, anything like what happened in Randolph to happen here in our school. Um, and I think it could have been very easily avoidable. Um, so that, I guess that was my big takeaway from that. Um, and that was the only board comment that I had, so. Okay. All right. Um, I guess, uh, you know, it's what I would comment on the situation is, um, you know, I think as board members, we do have the right to have private opinions and express them or our own opinions and express them. And I do did see the, the posts and Shannon was explicit in saying, I do not speak for the board. That being said, we are voting on a um, social media policy today. And, you know, I think that as board members, we should try and abide by the social media policy we're going to be asking our employees to abide by. And so in the areas where things may have transgressed that social media policy, I think, you know, going forward, we all need to be careful to abide, you know, by what we're asking the, the um, employees to abide by. Um, so I think that's all. Sorry, we'll hold public comment for the end. So thank you. Maybe just to clarify quickly, if you're okay with that, Andrew, there is another um, somewhere in here. <laughs> There is another public comment section. Yes. So normally we open it to public comment, we'll go through our agenda items, and then there's an opportunity for, I guess you'd call rebuttal, public comment period for yeah. another yeah. public Just comment period. Public. I happen to jump on late, <laughs> so. Okay. Okay, I think we can move on unless there's any other board comment at this time. Um, let's move to the celebration of learning, learning at the uh, the Middle Grades Institute Spotlight for Summer Planning. May I introduce that, Mr. Kanari? Yes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. I'm Owen Bradley, the White River Valley Middle School Principal. Nice to see a student here. <laughs> and um, Siobhan Kelly, one of our teachers, is going to talk tonight about some of the Middle Grades Institute study that they've done and that it's about our advisory system and how that works for us. I, do you see Siobhan there, Mr. Ballou? Before she does that, I'll just say that um, the Middle Grades Institute, which is hosted by UVM and St. Michael's College, has uh, existed for over 30 years. We've sent a team to that since we became a middle school for the last four years. The work that comes out of there is based in an action research model, which is that teachers work together and create something that they all will work on throughout the school year to better the school. And I would turn it over to Siobhan Kelly, and that would go through, of course, Mr. Ballou. I'm sure you'll figure out how to get her on. I'm gonna move. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ray, let me know if I'm good to go, I guess. Yep, go ahead, Siobhan. Okay, um, I'm Siobhan Kelly. I teach English at the White River Valley Middle School. Um, I've been teaching in, in the classroom I'm in for about seven years, so pre-merger, for those of you that don't know me. Um, and uh, yeah, so 
At MGI this year, we focus on um, our pod program, which also incorporates our uh, morning advisory program, um, where we uh, sort of greet students and anchor them for their day every morning. And then um, in the afternoons, twice a week, um, we work on some various projects. So I'm gonna give a little bit of um, context for what the pod program is kind of where it started and, and where it is now, and specifically um, the improvements we're trying to make this year. Uh, so the pods formed because of pandemic teaching, which required uh, self-contained groups. Um, and that was in the year 2020-2021 school year. Um, and then in the next school year, 2021-2022, that continued. Um, mostly due to the positive regard that students and teachers felt for the program is it the deeper connections it um, enabled us to create between student to student within the pod and also teacher to student um, and uh, however throughout the year we got some feedback from community parents students and even amongst our own teachers about sort of what the value was of this. Um, we knew that it had some value, like I said, in that like creating deeper relationships, but we kind of found ourselves in um, what my graduate professor would call project land, where everybody was doing all these different projects and they didn't necessarily have a lot of um, bigger learning goals or uh, targets that really went with them. Also, there's a lot of inequity between each group, depending on um, what that pod leader decided to pursue for projects and the way that they approached it. So this year, we tried to solve some of those problems um, in our work over um, at MGI. Um, so we had some questions such as like, what are the skills and dispositions that we hope students will acquire in pod? We settled on um, citizenship, scholarship, relationship, and ownership, which were four um, pillars identified back when we were sort of first coming together as a school and deciding what our values were gonna be. And that was worked on with student um, input. So we thought that that would be um, the best choice for pod since pod is really supposed to be very student centered. Um, and then um, we asked how would we align those skills and dispositions to the practices we implement in, in pod and so like the first thing was really just taking that time to do that backward design pick the goals first and then figure out how we were going to get there um, and then i did am i able to share my um screen yes okay um so i made this and it's really um just something i made for myself um, and it's a Venn diagram of some different um, teaching initiatives and the ways that they overlap. Um, so one element of POD is negotiated curriculum. So that's where the students get to have voice in what they're learning about and, and what projects they're working on. Um, so that involves their own passion projects. It involves integrated curriculum. I saw that as a connection with our goal of scholarship and ownership. Um, and then we have our uh, social emotional learning, that's what SEL stands for, um, and restorative practices, and that's sort of the advisory program part of it. And I saw that as going with our practices around regular restorative circles, identity exploration, and team building activities, and obviously that lends to relationship. Um, and then community connections at the bottom, um, and that kind of goes along with the idea of, uh, you know, projects that have to do with community service. And also we have our student-led conferences that connect the parents and teachers and students together. And I saw that as aligning with our goal of citizenship. And then, you know, there are some overlapping areas um, and with sort of the, um, the, the, the middle, the, the best part, uh, projects and initiatives that students make that improve our community. So let's, Kind of where we're all um, trying to get to. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing that part. And um, we really chose these um, 
important ways of learning because they promote putting students at the center um, and they help students who uh, have issues associated with things like trauma, which disproportionately impact marginalized students, including BIPOC and LGBTQ plus students, and they improve our school and local community overall. Um, the way that we are promoting equity and consistency through all of the pods this year is um, continuing our common planning time and using shared resources. I think really the backwards design is, um, you know, obviously the foundation of all of that. And so like knowing that that's our shared goal um, really helps us drive that planning time we have together. Um, and then our final question was how do we effectively assess these skills and dispositions and then report out to families. So we're using um, a student portfolio that is a, um, a set of slides, Google slides, a slide deck um, that students are going to use to keep track of their learning and set goals throughout the school year. Um, and then we're also uh, made um, progress reports that students can fill out and send home to their parents that um, kind of get more of the um, the nitty gritty uh, grades reports and um, would be something that uh, would help parents see um, that part of it too and, and be kept in the loop with the, the grades as well because the student-led conferences are really more about what the student wants to share and what's important to them as a person and not necessarily um, how many assignments they have missing and things like that, um, which parents always want to know about and should know about, but we were trying to find a way to do that that didn't um, overshadow what the kids want to share. Um, and so where we're at right now is uh, we're working on a project focused on student identity. So they're going to be making something that shows who they were, who they are now, who they want to be in the future. So that's our first big project. And we're all working from the same uh, lesson plans with that. So that helps create the equity between the pods. Um, we are rolling out our portfolio tomorrow, which kids will work on during pod time, but we'll also work on in all of their other classes. Um, so they can make connections in their learning between the discrete subject areas. And then we are currently in the process of setting out progress reports. We're all kind of in different spots with that, but we have started that um, for the first round. And we're kind of finding that we feel like we don't have enough time um, common planning wise and also um, with our students in pod to address all of these really important initiatives. So. Um, trying to make our schedule cooperate with all the really great stuff we want to do. All right, thank you. And now I'm ready for questions. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um, it is. Yeah, well, it's great to hear that you guys are are focusing on bringing some more rigor to uh, to the pod time and making sure that there's a focus for it. Um, so just to clarify, all the pods are doing uh, basically the same project at the same time. Okay. And, Currently. And it sounds like all the teachers are kind of involved in planning what the project will be together. Yeah. So the project we're using is adapted from one that had already been, um, like the lessons had already been planned out. Okay. Um, so we were able to take that and adapt it for each of our groups. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that was great about the previous one was when a teacher was kind of had something that was inspired them or whatever, then you know, there were some really special results that kind of came out of that. And of course, the downside of that is the equity part where, you know, sometimes if you luck out and get into one of those groups, then you get a great project. And if not, then, you know, so I, do you feel like the staff is is kind of enthusiastic about this approach and um i think people appreciate um it taking the load off from them to have to like make a lesson plan sure um because it's already been done for them but i do think that um it can be um, challenging teaching um, materials that you didn't necessarily make 
and aren't necessarily made in the way that you want to make them. It's hard for me to speak for my coworkers, um, but we have been trying to find ways to sort of balance the time we spend on um, this project as well as um, other, like, you know, going back to activity land a little bit just to um, give teachers the chance to be creative with what their passions are and to share those with students and to give kids like a time to connect with each other where they're not being asked to do something that feels very academic. So sure. we have two hours of pod time. Usually when I have my pod, we'll do one hour working on like the big project we all are working on together. And then we have an hour that we design together as far as what activity we're going to do or how we're going to spend the time. OK. Does anybody else have questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. It's good to hear about how this is evolving. All right. Thank you, Siobhan. Uh, early to bed. You have school tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. OK. We'll move to the reports to the board, um, starting with superintendent. Uh, I'll start. Thanks to all the staff that have been participating in our celebrations of learning. I think it really get, gets us focused on the work that we're doing with kids. So thank you for, for joining us tonight, Siobhan. Um, and uh, so the, the, there's going to be a community letter coming out from me tomorrow uh, to the board, teachers, uh, greater community parents, uh, talking about that we just found out just over a week ago that the Agency of Education is making a pivot with how they measure standardized um, testing scores based on the Common Core State Standards, so accountability measures. So prior we did Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium <coughs> testing, SBAC. That's now going away and being replaced with... Cognio. What is that? Cognio. Cognio, thank you. I totally made up the name at Sharon earlier tonight. I knew it started with a C. Um, and so parents will see in my letter, I will reference what the Secretary of Ed has indicated are the reasons why a shift. Um, we are, we've done some research on this pivot to this new assessment platform. There's not a lot of information um, readily available for us at this time. As soon as we have it, we will be sharing it out with faculty, staff, in families, we still expect the testing window to be in the spring. It is, and I mentioned this in the letter, it is still measuring our students' achievement on the Common Core State Standards and Next Generation Science Standards. So it is measuring the same standards, but the testing um, system being used by the state to do that accountability measure has changed. Um, and so that letter is going out. Um, I also wanted to mention to the board, the full board retreat is on Thursday evening. It's an opportunity for the full board to get together. Um, dinner will be provided. It's happening right here in South Royalton. Also looking at the full board's 22-23 uh, performance goals that have been recommended for adoption, which are aligned um, pretty closely to my superintendent professional goals, with the concept being that the full board and the superintendent should be working hand in hand on the same task and outcomes and outputs. Um, and then also I have received some feedback on the strategic plan. I've got some time put away tomorrow to try to work on another draft. There's going to be some suggestions I won't get in the draft too, but I'm gonna at least start to incorporate some of that. So it'll be a rough draft too, and then I'll share with the board where we hope to expand that strategic plan to. Um, and so that's on the agenda for Thursday night as well. And then um, I'll take any questions the board may have. <laughs> I have a question. Um, on replacing the SBAC, one of the challenges we have had jumping around with all of these different forms of testing and COVID and all the things that have been thrown at us in five years with a brand new district is where the heck do our kids stand? <laughs> and is performance improving? How is this going? How are teachers doing? Are we going to be able to compare anything to the SBAC scores we already have, or are we starting completely over with a whole other barrel of oranges instead of apples? Well, we'll have we'll have new scale scores, and so what we'll be able to do is at least have a sense of where is our cohort scale scores at with this new assessment system versus where they were before. The score won't equate to the same, 
but at least we'll know based on where the skills score was versus the state average, whether or not we're doing as, as well compared to the state average. And so the SU board had set goals by 2025 that in literacy we would be above the state average scale score and in math that we would be meeting the state average. And so we'll still have a state average scale score and a district scale score. They just, that scale score won't be the equivalent to what the Smarter Balance Assessment scale score is. We still, the Smarter Balance Assessment testing data from last spring is still embargoed. I heard a rumor that the Secretary French may release them later this week or the first of next week. I'm hopeful that that happens. And then you will receive the RUD results at your upcoming November meeting, along with Track My Progress testing. Um, will be this, the fall testing for Track My Progress will be shared at November meetings as well. That's the first round using this. Yeah, track it, I think it's just frustrating because we were hoping that our math scores would go up, and so not being able to compare is going to be really difficult. Well, we can still compare them to the state average yeah. scale score. Okay. It is what it is. Yeah, it was not. A, <laughs> that, that that is not a local decision by any means. It was a state decision. So. Well, hopefully it'll measure what we want to measure better than the yes, so. All right. Um, any other questions for Jamie or comments? And we'll move to the principals. So uh, thank you and welcome. Our, we do this on the three goals. The first one that we have lined up there in your report is. Um, and just I'll do this for the for the crowd here tonight to continue to develop a robust multi-tiered system of support for students we highlighted the elementary universal team I'm, I'm happy to speak to it so <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna mansplain it I know don't <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a universal team and one of the things we do is we have an elementary wildcat Fridays um, and we mix, we're so excited to do this this year, we mix in mixed age groups. Um, and so there's one, one week a week, one week a month is a lesson on respect. Right now we're setting respect. And then we have our assembly. And this two Fridays ago, we had our first whole school community builder where we bust Bethel over here and did Apple activities in mixed groups all day long, which just, it felt really good to have the whole school year. It was really funny. The kids from Bethel saw me. They're like, "What are you doing here?" I'm like, "I know you don't know that I'm actually here half the time." Uh, so it was it was just really great. And so they um, got to be with like age peers and mixed groups, uh, press apples, do different apple relays, and all things appley. But um, it was it was a good feel good event, and uh, I'm happy to do more of that. I think we're going to try to do that a couple different times a year. So I'm excited for Royalton to get busted to Bethel, so they can also do the "What are you doing here?" Huh. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, I think we'll go to the second goal, and it's enhancement of our proficiency learning model with attention to literacy, math, and flexible pathways. I'm going to highlight that from the middle school, and we've been very busy, and we are working with Regeneration Core, and one of the things we're doing I want to highlight is our flexible pathways work that we've done. Mr. West as you know, the board uh, has taken on that role. And I was thinking about it with the pod advisory piece and projects. That's really turned into a place where groups of students can have a project or an individual student can have a project. There's actually one of the students in the audience tonight is a store owner at the school. And they have worked uh, to help develop a <laughs> school store that uh, Liberty has done that that will move on to other students so it's shared among the students. And uh, I'm not gonna put you on the spot too much, Liberty, but I'll keep saying your name out loud and maybe you'll get extra credit. And the store has been very successful. They've lined it up with popcorn day that the elementary does, so we've taken full advantage of that. We sell popcorn. And we sell other school products kids might need, pencils, erasers, all of those things. And we'll have more of that coming and they're learning the the, how a business works and how it runs and, and more to come on that. So goal three, and we'll let, uh, let, we'll have Jeff take that one on. And goal three, I'm just gonna read it out loud if you don't mind, Jeff. Expanding our community outreach in ways that help us effectively engage and partner with students, parents, and our broader community. 
So to start with, we had a great homecoming with the bonfire and the night game for soccer. And then uh, we had open house. And open house this year was like community. We had a great barbecue. There was a fine chef that they really had nice come chef. in. There was some pizza that was delivered there. And uh, it was a great evening. So we started with the barbecue. And then it was like, uh, instead of uh, the schedule being eight minutes and, and uh, parents going to each classroom for eight minutes, which seems like too much and it's chaotic. It was just kind of like teachers were in their rooms and parents were uh, mingling with them. It was kind of great. And then we ended the night with a concert and it was our, our choir and our band and it was just awesome. It was such a great night. And it was funny because like I was in the hallways and there was quite a few people there, but then we walked in the auditorium. The whole community, it seemed like the whole town was there. It was a great evening. So uh, community is a big part of that. Uh, we have uh, our senior-led group called Cool Cats that are doing a podcast. If you want to see the podcast or listen to the podcast, you can listen to that on our website. There's uh, Their podcasts are there. And they're going to be doing a, a visual one, and we're getting a TV screen so that kids can see the news and community members that come through the school can get that news from the uh, Cool Cats. Um, t just yesterday, we uh, went on an outing. It was our first school outing. We had uh, kids chose uh, hiking, mountain biking, uh, rock climbing, kayaking, and life skills back home. Um, so it was a great event for, I think, to build community in our school, so. Questions for us or comments? There's a bunch more in the report, as you know. I would just add, last but not least, our new our new newsletter has been launched, um, and it looks really good if you haven't seen it. Um, and a lot of thanks to Kate McLean who helped us reformat it so that when you get the email, it's right there and not you don't have to click a link. So I think it's really beautiful, and we're really proud of it. Yeah, thank you. I did appreciate the new newsletter. I, I also would say, in regards to both the flexible pathways and community outreach, the Facebook posts communicating the flexible pathways. It, there's been good communication on that, and I, I appreciate that. So. Uh, does anybody else have anything for the principals? Thank you. We're always there if you need us. And the pictures are really nice. Yeah. So, yeah. It's nice Jeff to gets credit for that. With the, <laughs> He's up the information with the picture, you know, yeah. even if you didn't have the opportunity to go to it. You know, so. Yes. Um, Tara's not here, but. Tara, yeah, okay. Business manager. Tara and I are splitting duties. I was at Sharon earlier tonight, but they had a large presentation on a possible expansion project. So I had her stay there and I'm fielding for her uh, here. So you have a report in hand. Uh, I'll be able to speak to the proposed student support budget as well, which is draft one, and walk newer board members too about the budget process around draft two, draft three, draft four. Um, the We've been wrapping up our um, audit, and so we're on to good timing to have that wrapped up and approved by boards December, January, like last year. So we'll have those numbers and the projected surplus to use for budgeting process and um, or special um, reserve funds. The other big thing that we have going on right now is, um, frankly, due to the audit that we received back in 1920 if you remember that audit had some areas of concern <laughs> that we yeah the school year 19 into 20 but there was um some areas that we needed to work on in the fiscal office which we did and cleaned up we had no findings in 2021 the aoe still works off of that 1920 audit and so what that means is the aoe is um, in our office auditing all of our federal grants this upcoming month um, all of our ESSER funds, title funds. Um, so the business office has been in, uh, engaged deeply in audits, both from the auditors that we hire that do a single audit on us, and also um, working with the Agency of Education. So I will speak for Tara that she's been working incredibly hard. The good news is we did uh, secure a payroll slash accountant person. Uh, so the business office is back up to uh, fully staffed at three people. So that. That's been a huge relief for Tara. Uh, do you know how long the, the 1920 audit is going to be on our record or whatever? Now that the 2021's that that that's been completed and approved, moving forward fiscally, the AOE will use that audit, not that 1920 audit. But Good. what it does is it, it flags us for areas of concern, right? So the sure. agency needs to really make certain that they're checking in on us. Okay. Any other business manager related questions? 
Okay. Um, so, full board, the uh, supervisory and full board updates on the Lincoln School Districts. So let me just give yeah. a quick overview of that. Yeah, so you received a um, uh, email from Kathy Galuzzo, our WRBSU um, chair, in regards to um, requesting that the board consider writing letters um, and or community members consider writing letters to um, the uh, state board chair and um, Secretary French in opposition of Lincoln School District joining the WRBSU. The WRBSU full board did a, a straw poll um, at our September meeting. It was unanimous that we were opposed, the, the full board was opposed to having Lincoln join us. Um, just to, and not all the board members were there. So the, the history with this is Lincoln back in the spring voted to decouple from the Mount Abraham Union Unified School District, which serves the towns of Bristol, New Haven, uh, Starksboro, Moncton, Moncton, Lincoln, and um, Bristol. And so they voted to um, decouple because the Mount Abraham Unified School District is currently going to be holding a vote in early November for them to have what the state board calls a super merger with the district that serves Virgin High, Virgin's High School, which is Addison Northwest. And so that would become one merged pre-K-12 district that has multiple elementary schools and, and has two high schools. Within that um, proposed merger, the articles of agreement have changed that um, a smaller school could be closed by a supermajority vote of the, the whole unified district versus the town of the school um, being proposed to be closed in. That was um, frightening for Lincoln, so they decoupled. They um, approached me back in July to see if there'd be any desire of White River Valley to work with Lincoln. I shared with them the opposition that the full board had around Lincoln joining us a year prior, and sorry, uh, Ripton joining us a year prior, and reminded them that Lincoln is geographically much further for us than Ripton even is. So I said I didn't think that the full board would be entertaining that, but that I would certainly be checking in with the board. I didn't find out until about five days before the state board hearing that in a letter from Lincoln to the state board that they um, had designated us as their preferred choice of placement. Um, and I found out actually through a letter that had been t directed to the state board that we were not copied on. Um, so we went and uh, testified in opposition to that. Um, and we've also run financials. We expect the addition of Lincoln to be approximately, and this is a conservative figure, of about $450,000 addition to the SU budget. And you may say, well, why? They're a small school. Our ability to share special ed services is really difficult because our closest school is 50 minutes away in Rochester where now we'll, we'll share staff across multiple schools like Sharon, Stratford, Tunbridge, Chelsea, or Bethel, Rochester, Stockbridge, specifically 15 or 50? 50. 50. 50, 50 okay. um, on a really good day. Yeah. Um, and so that means all related service providers, special educator, we wouldn't be able to share even though they have a school that's about 74 students right now. And their enrollment has been declining. And so we, d we estimate that their average daily membership will continue to decrease. And remember, we assess out as an SU around average daily membership. So the increased cost at the SU level versus their uh, percentage paying in at the SU budget, it, it was not to a net positive for the member districts of WRBSU other than Granville Hancock which is a non-operating district. Um, they're the only ones that would see any tax relief by Lincoln joining. Um, and so the, right now the state board can make a decision of Lincoln becoming its own supervisory district and having to create their own supervisory services as a standalone district. They could take and decouple Mount Abraham Union and make them a supervisory union, which is not the preferred governance model for the state board. They prefer one unified district governance model. They could place them with us, or they could place them with Central Vermont Supervisory Union. And Central Vermont Supervisory Union is Northfield, Williamstown, Orange, Washington, two districts 
one SU, and geographically they are closer um, than we are. And so we expect um, Secretary French to make a recommendation to the State Board in November, and the State Board will take action on this in November. And supervisory union boundaries are at the leisure of the State Board. They can redraw those. And so um, there's not any legal argument for us to make. It really is, uh, frankly, a political argument about how this could be a detriment for the WRVSU students. Um, and so that's the argument we've been making. Um, we, are having, we are creating a contingency budget at the SU level in the event that Lincoln is placed with us, and we'll be sharing that throughout the budget process to the SU board um, because the state board has requested that we do so. Um, our business manager is meeting with the Mount Abraham Unified School District business manager and the CBSU business manager on Friday so that we're creating budgets together so there can't be argument that one district is creating a different budget that's inflated versus another. And so they're sitting down. Also, the Mount Abraham Unified School District has a real good sense of what services they're currently needing and, and getting provided. So Tara's doing that Friday um, as well. And what percentage currently does our budget carry of the superintendent's budget? At uh, the SU, I, you know, like that, it was a little over 40. It's in the book. I don't have it off the top of my head. I know that your ADM dropped a little bit, so it actually decreased last year, mm -hmm. the percentage-wise. Um, I can send that, you that information. I just don't have it readily available. Tara could tell you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for that update. Keep our fingers crossed. Um, <clears throat> okay. Unless there's any other comments or questions, move on to the um, policy committee update, uh, proposed flag policy meeting. Um, I believe this was sent to everybody in the, with the board documents, the proposed flag policy. Um, has everybody had a chance to read it and does anybody have any feedback? Yeah, yeah, I've had, um ample time to review it I think <clears throat> well I mean you know we were I don't know what was it June I think when we had um, mm -hmm. our first opportunity for um, input into the flag um, and uh, you know kind of looking through this I think the thing that scares me is is anything that we put in a form that could be subjective because um, when it when it becomes subjective then it kind of loses the purpose of the intent, which, so right now the policy, the way I see it is, is pretty subjective when, um, you know, a student slash teacher sponsored um, symbol would then go to the superintendent to get um, read through and make sure that it is meeting certain criteria to then be voted on at the board. So there's there's quite a bit of subjectivity, and I'm, you know, for both both ends or, or any end of it. So that concerns me because you know one board could be different than another, and superintendent could be different than another. You know, so there's lots of lots of combinations there that could affect the, the students. Um, I have been looking at it, and um, this flag policy here is very similar to the one that Waterbury has. Um, and I was looking at some of the other issues right now, and um, there's there's been several issues that have reversed their policies of late, uh, going from um, a flag policy back to a restrictive based policy based upon uh, feedback from the communities, as well as you know, as obviously litigations and things going on throughout the state and the country with with different things. Um, that so. Reading through this, one thing that I came that came to my mind on, you know, how can we make this work, but at the same time, not make an adult or an adults that could be politically motivated or through subject matter not want to take place in it or will want to take place in it. How can we, you know, the the the, the initial goal is that this is a student a student body presented symbol that they want to fly high at their campus, right? I mean, that's kind of the goal. So how can we do that? So I guess what I was thinking, and, and I like a lot of the, the verbiage in here, but 
how about having the students make their own proposal you know maybe there's somebody that can help them make sure that the criteria that's in the policy is established um, still have an individual either you know a, a principal or or I don't know if everything needs to go to the SU but have somebody be able to look through that application to make sure that those criteria that were spelled out in the policy um, are met because I think I think the policy uh, the criteria was good um, on you know uh, meeting goals that support uh, the school and, and, and things that you know could be hatred pieces uh, make sure those are all accounted for and then what I was thinking and this was after talking to um, some students as well as my own daughter is is why not establish this as a democratic event where students could then on campus for a period of time and it's a week or two weeks period is vote on it. So say this is the application that we want to do, this is the symbol that we want to fly at this campus and then have a democratic event where the, the student body can vote on it through a ballot process. Not a how many people want it, raise your hand, but more of a um, it will be available at the make it up, cafeteria where you can vote on it for a week and then have a process to collect the votes and, and establish the results, right? And then, you know, the results carry the day. Um, I think it would be a good learning event um, for students, uh, one, to have their voices heard, um, two, learn about the democratic process that they will have to take place when they get to be adults, um, and, and, you know, obviously experiencing the power of vote. And, and you know, um, so I guess that was kind of my, my take on it. Um, so you're suggesting basically taking the board out of it, and so it goes to the administration, then the students vote on it, and if the students approve, then it yeah. goes up. Because um, I think the way it is right now is, I mean, looking, looking through just the state of Vermont, there are several boards that either have restrictive policies that are keeping them restrictive, there are policies that have flagged policies that have gone back to restrictive policies. And then there are some like like um, um, Waterbury and some other ones that do have a flag policy, but there's, it, it, it's a mixture out there. So I'm trying to think of how can we do this? Um, it seems to be a lot of the comments, negative comments out there on the flag policies is that it becomes subjective. So the board's gonna approve it or not approve it. And if they don't approve this one, how can they say they're not, you know, if they prove this one, how can they say they're not going to prove this one if it meets it? You know what I mean? So if this is truly a, a student-led initiative, then why not let the students have their voices heard and, and vote on it and, you know, I don't know, put it into rules. 51% or whatever it is, then, then, then it goes up. And I have a clarifying question. Sorry to interrupt. Yep. So my understanding of the policy, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that these proposals would already be student proposals, student applications, possibly from a group of students, most likely from a group of students, that put all these components together. So to clarify, the thing that you're asking to change is just that it wouldn't go through the board, it would go through a vote of students. Yeah, because the way the proposal is set because I actually like a lot of the proposal that it has to, the students have to do a lot of the front well, end work. I, and, I think and, that's great. And the way the Learning proposal experience. is in layman's terms right now is that the, the students and or a sponsor would mm -hmm. help put the, we'll call it an application together, right? Mm -hmm. And then that application would then go to the superintendent to review to make sure that uh, okay. certain criteria is, yeah. is in it. Um, and then after that, then it would come to the board for a right. vote. And I guess where I'm at is, I would rather see that go to the students to vote on, rather than have the board, uh, which could be a board made up of all kinds of different individuals at different times and different, you know, settings that could, um, sure, vote negative, positive, or whatever towards things. So I'm just thinking, why not have the students do it? Um, yeah, I mean, they do have a demonstrated student support for the proposed flag, but that is somewhat vague, so, you know. But, like, right now, the way it is is make it up, but, you know, someone could propose it. It could be, a, it could be 
five students that could propose wanting to put a symbol up with a, mm -hmm. a teacher helping them put the application together, right? And then it would go to Jamie. Jamie would look through the criteria, say, uh, okay, it met everything, or no, it didn't. I'm going to kick it back. Won't you correct this? And then it would go to us to vote on. Um, but I just thought maybe, well, one, I think it's a good idea to have the students' voices heard. But two, I think it's a good opportunity for them to learn the process of voting, uh, having your voice heard, actually voting, because there'll be students that probably won't vote, or, and, and they don't have to be scared to vote yes, no, for, against, whatever it is, right? Uh, so I, that, that's kind of my, my take on it. But Does the administration have any feedback on the workability of doing that? My, I think the only, the concern I could hear from some of my district boards being that this would be an SU-wide SU -wide policy, and that's what our policy says. And so I think some of my districts that operate schools of, you know, K-6 could really struggle with that concept. I was thinking that when I was looking at our two campuses is how, how would that look at the elementary school level, right? Because a lot of these um, topics come up at maybe the middle school level and higher. So, you know, how would that, how would that look? But um, I was just trying to find a way that we could right. have the students' uh, I mean, expressions heard, but. I, I guess like what we, if, if we do want to keep it something that would apply to the whole SU, there's nothing that prevents us by say, from saying as a board, like demonstrated student support should show majority student support or something. Um, and then basically they would go through that process and then bring it to us and then we could basically rubber stamp it. <laughs> or, or, or how would they show, I guess in that case, how would they show their majority of support? So well, I mean, would they have a vote? Because it I could guess be I part back, of the procedures that I guess I get back to that. You no, know, as well, I, I think it's best for students to have the ability to vote sure. in privacy, so that they, regardless if they vote for or against something, that you know they're not harassed or or you know yeah. something after yeah. the fact of that you didn't support it or you did support it or you know I agree. It's whatever. Just, there's a lot of logistics that go with that. If you're going to leave a box out for a week, are right. you ballot stuffing? Mm -hmm. Are you like there's there's just logistics that go with running sure. that that would be on our administrators. And, and I think little, some of the cool things that like at the high school I mean, level. Maybe we could do it by Google. At the high school level, I, correct me if I'm wrong, you have student council. So it's an opportunity for the student council to be in action, right? Uh, they could take control of the ballot box and put it in a secret, you know, or, or a uh, secured location overnight. They could be the ones to count the ballot. And I think maybe at the middle school level, and of course, you got to figure out the elementary school level, but. At the middle school level, maybe it's an opportunity to resurrect a, uh, you know, a small board of students that want to take part in the, you know, the, their civic duties. Um, but, I mean, I think the way it is, if it's got to come back to the board, it, it, it just puts us in a difficult yeah, situation no. because it becomes, at this point, if it meets the criteria, you need to approve it, right? But that doesn't mean that this board, we might see that right now. We might approve every single one that comes through that meets the criteria, but the next board or the next person in the seat might not do that. And then, you know, it yeah. becomes an unfair system for everybody. Well, but at the same time, like, we're voted on by the public. So, you know, if people vote for a board that will reject flags, right. then, you know, that so be it, <laughs> you know? Um, but I was also thinking on the on the um, the piece of litigation into things is how a lot of you know boards have reversed their policies just because of fear of litigation for certain topics right now, and that's you know Randolph reversed theirs, Wyndham uh, SU reversed theirs. So if we had this more as a hey, the students supported this, and here here's how we can show the students supported this. Then, then in some ways wouldn't, I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, but yeah, sure. would that take some of that potential litigation off our plate at the board level and say, well, the, the, the students' voices were heard, uh, rather than say, you approved this one, but you didn't approve this one, so now we're going to sue you. Sure. You know, so I guess that was kind of my thinking throughout. Yeah, I would say whatever, I'll bring all this feedback back 
with Rodney to the, the policy committee. There's been feedback on this um, policy as proposed by every board. So I think the policy committee is gonna, gonna have some work to do uh, over the next month um, based on that feedback. And it's important for the board to know that, that every policy that we put in front of you for approval is vetted by the board, uh, by our attorney or written. So example, this policy was modeled after Harwood Union, but our attorney crafted this. This wasn't crafted by me or my office. This was crafted by our, our district attorney. But it's, you know, again, it still doesn't stop somebody from litigating against it, right? Mm -hmm. then, well, I mean, they're saying that they think that we've got a real strong argument not to be litigated against, right? That's why we're, we were even looking to do a policy to begin with. We pay them to make certain our policies are not going to be litigated. That's right. <laughs> and if they are, then we we're going to win. No, I mean, we can litigate anything. Right, and that we're going to win. No. But it's again, it, it, it just becomes that there is a scary situation where sure. not just the board could get could be sued, but individually board members could be sued for mm -hmm. things too. So, I mean, I don't want to be in a court of law <clears throat> having to defend myself every time we pass or don't pass something, right? So, I guess that was, how can we make that easier for everybody? Right. But still, the topic at hand would move forward, right? Sure. So. Um, do we want to have any further comments on the flag policy? Okay. I'm, I'm going to bring your proposal, as you said it, Chris, to our attorneys to get their thoughts. That's going to be a next step for Yeah. I, and I'll share your thoughts and the attorney's response at the policy committee. Thanks. Okay. Moving on to our action items. Um, so the first policy we'll be looking at adopting is the social media policy. Um, we've had a couple of readings of this already, um, and it's been warned and posted in the papers that we would be voting on this tonight. Um, is there any uh, discussion on this item? Well, I, I hadn't had any comments on it. I was going to pass it as, as written, but we also had some of the comments earlier in regards to how how do board members be held responsible for their actions? Um, and I know it's tricky because, you know, technically an elected position, the, the voters elect the person, the voters can unelect the person. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the process there. And <coughs> now, right now we have, um, so us two are appointed. Right. We have an empty seat. So let's say we had three appointed individuals half the board would be appointed, which I think in that case, appointees would fall more under the policy because you aren't an elected official. Does that sound correct? You're still a volunteer, no, not yeah. an appointee. Uh, so you wouldn't employees. fall under the policy the way it was if you were an appointed individual? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess the at this question, you know, from what the, the audience is, you know, how would a board member be um, held responsible for a lot of the same things that we're asking our administration and teachers to be. Um, or is that a separate whole policy that may needs to be looked yeah. at? Um, uh, I think we would need to get do a separate policy for board if we wanted to have something along those lines. Okay. Now this is to apply to the um, employees of the supervisory union. Sure, yep. Um, you know, I, I do think we should follow it because we're asking them to, and it's, you know, right. we should hold ourselves to the same standards we'd expect everybody else to be held to, by the people that we're asking to follow. So, um, but I, you know, it's certainly not like a, th this wouldn't apply in a strict manner to board members. <coughs> so other than that, I, I would make a motion to accept Policy B35, the social media policy. I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Good. Passed unanimously. All right. Thank you. We have passed policy B35. 
Move to policy C35, the verification of student residency for tuition payment policy and corresponding affidavits. Um, so again, we've had this at the last couple of board meetings as, as reading and for feedback. Um, and at this point, we're looking to adopt it. It applies mostly to the tuition towns, not so much to us. Um, so um, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to act to adopt policy C35, the verification of student residency for tuition payment policy and corresponding affidavit. Okay, second it. <coughs> okay, any discussion? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the policy passes unanimously. Rodney, was was oh, that an aye or an opposed? Right. No, I, I vote aye. I okay. Agree. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, moving on to the, yeah. So I'll move on to the discussion items. So we've got uh, the presentation from the administration on the proactive and reactive procedures in place regarding hazing, harassment, and bullying. I'd like to, I don't need to do all this talking to you two. I'm good at it. Though. I'd like to introduce Shane Oaks to do some more Mr. talking. Shane Oaks. <laughs> mm. yeah. Come Great on. I'd like to hear from you though. I know. Do you guys want to explain Shane Oaks' role? Yeah, that's, that's what I was going to do. Yeah. <laughs> Shane Oaks is one of three student support coordinators. Shane is also a um, an invaluable employee that helps resolve problems among students, among faculty, and most especially among the principals. Just kidding. <laughs> and Shane is um, representing those two other folks, uh, Ashley Groach, Sandy Tracy, but also he works very directly with us on the hazing, harassment, and bullying work, and he acts as our uh, Title IX coordinator for the SU. Shane can introduce himself really well. And, and a bunch of you got to know Shane as our COVID-19 coordinator in the past. Happy not to be yes, I thought my <laughs> poor guy. thought my board meeting days were behind me, but that's <laughs> not. Uh, so thank you, Owen. Yes, I'm Shane Oaks. Uh, happy to work here as student support coordinator on the South Wilton campus and uh, focus primarily with the high school students this year. Um, and happy to speak about our hazing, harassment, and bullying policies um, here. Uh, what, how are bullying and harassment policies being implemented uh, here at school? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think it's important to recognize that all staff uh, across the uh, district go through uh, different trainings on hazing, harassment, and bullying. Uh, it is through uh, vector training that we do uh, annually at the beginning of each school year, and then new staff coming on do as part of their orientation that provides a really thorough foundation understanding of what um, hazing harassment and bullying look like different scenarios that it might come up and, and brings awareness uh, and general understanding to the issue um, so that's something all staff go through and then kind of as Owen alluded to Beyond that, we have uh, teams of, of folks that really work to specialize in this area and be able to respond to this. So uh, each uh, administrator um, is part of that team and they're the decision maker when it comes to uh, responses um, there. Um, but also they work in conjunction with uh, designated employees who work to conduct investigations, take referrals, um, and really um, kind of dig into situations that come up uh, to understand what happened um, there. So those folks, uh, and you know, I see Ashley on the call with us uh, as well, uh, go through an additional level of training uh, and currently we're engaged in that. You didn't need to bring Ashley. <laughs> bigger, bigger. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we are, we are taking um, a series of trainings on both uh, hazing, harassment, and bullying and Title IX that is being uh, held and facilitated by VisBet and an attorney that works um, 
to put that together. And that is really specialized to Vermont law and statute. So it's, uh, you know, the vector training I think is, is more broad, but this really speaks to uh, specifically what we need here in Vermont. Um, and also provides us with a lot of tools and resources uh, that guide the process um, through. So, next steps. Um, so, as I just mentioned, uh, the administrative, uh, the administrators and the designated employees have been going through additional training through VisBit that goes through November. Um, as a result of this, we have uh, adopted a new referral form uh, for tracking and documentation uh, for all situations that might come up throughout the, the school year. And I think that's really a, an important part of the process because uh, you know, not all concerns that come forward are actually meet the, the level or definition of uh, bullying or harassment, uh, but having that, that, uh, that paper trail uh, is important as uh, maybe patterns of behavior emerge. So, um, so that's really good. Um, we have so we rolled out this uh, form this year. We've uh, followed that up with training during faculty meetings, so that folks uh, on the ground that have gone through the vector training understand it, uh, know how to complete that, and who to give those referral forms to. Um, we work closely um, with, uh, in partnership with the police department um, to investigate um, and respond to situations. So part of the uh, bullying harassment, um, sometimes events happen outside of the community, but they have a profound impact on the school environment or a student's comfortability or willingness to come into school, which kind of makes it our um, issue and something that we have to deal with and respond to. Uh, and so I'm, I'm glad to say that we have a really strong relationship working with the police in conjunction when uh, situations like that that have come up that maybe didn't happen on school property but have impacted our school community. Um, so that's good. And the policies themselves are, can be found in the student handbooks, on school websites, and get mailed out to um, any individuals that uh, receive notification that a policy or that a uh, investigation may be opened up uh, regarding that, um, and then how do we how do we respond to um, situations? Uh, and and I think first and foremost we we work proactively uh, to create an environment and a culture uh, that is built on positive behavior, uh, mutual respect. Uh, we heard earlier presentations tonight talking about uh, our PBIS system at the elementary school uh, and the way that they are uh, delivering lessons on respect across the whole school. Uh, the middle school uh, mentioned that as well in their presentation with their advisory system, uh, some of the restorative practices that they do, uh, community building that goes into that, uh, and studies show that the the more positive and healthy your culture is, the fewer incidents of bullying, harassment, hazing are, are going to come up. And so that's really uh, been, a, been a focus uh, for us. Um, but that being said, there are going to be situations where things come up. Um, and so we need to respond to those. Um, and actions that would be taken. Um, you know, referral comes forward, uh, there will be uh, notification and a process that's followed, um, outlined by um, the VisBit training uh, with the formal referral, uh, notification letters, um, and then an investigation will start. Uh, if any of these are found to have taken place, uh, then there will be uh, consequences, a disciplinary action that's taken by the principal. Uh, that will be um, developmentally appropriate uh, and based on the situation and circumstances uh, presented in that situation. So uh, we don't have a, a blanket, this is what happens. It's really uh, administrator's choice decision based on uh, the facts and circumstances at hand. 
then there is a, a restorative or reparative work um, that may go into that uh, to try to repair the, the relationship, the damage that has been done to the community. Uh, and again, that is going to look different based on the, um, the situation itself, uh, the age uh, and stage for the, for the students uh, and the type of impact that it is have. Uh, but we work really closely to um, be sensitive uh, and do that reparative work where it's warranted. Uh, and then lastly, there needs to be safety planning uh, to make sure that uh, the victim in this situation um, knows that there are going to be uh, safety measures put in place to ensure that this uh, behavior doesn't happen again uh, and that they have the appropriate supports uh, to feel safe and to continue to engage their, um, in their schooling. So um, there are some additional things that we need to, uh, that we have on our to-do list of things to do. Uh, we will finalize our trainings uh, through VisBit. Those are uh, scheduled through November. Um, we've identified that we need to create a system for anonymously reporting uh, concerning our problem behavior. So right now we have identified staff within the buildings um, who uh, folks can go to. Uh, we really uh, create a culture uh, within the middle school and high school of having teacher advisors that really uh, support people and go to and, and we encourage students to uh, reach out and share concerns with any adult that they trust. Um, but this is something that just provides an additional um, layer um, for students to, to raise concerns with us. Uh, so we'll be looking to implement that. Um, and then at the end of the year, we'll be uh, within our leadership team structure, uh, kind of reviewing our data from the year, um, how things went uh, with the new uh, steps that we've implemented and see if there's any additional uh, training considerations, changes that we might need to make uh, looking into going to the next school year. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank Thanks, you, Shane. Um, does anybody have any questions or follow up with Shane? No, I had I had written two questions down, but I you just pretty much answered them on the last slide. One was, you know, how how could an individual student report a behavior uh, in a in a method that they wouldn't be in return harassed or you know honestly. So that was. That was good to see that because I think having experienced that with a child before, uh, you know, how, how can one safely report something without being a target, right? Um, and then the second one I had was because I had asked a question, I don't know, earlier this year in regards to another topic, but I had asked, you know, um, you know how many instances of, you know, uh, bullying as, you know, based upon, you know, either, you know, sexual orientation or another piece of it have we had inside uh, our campuses just so that we can see you know or you know do we have an issue what is the issue what's the magnitude of the issue um, so it was nice to see that you are going to be tracking it yes so at, I guess I at what level would you be trying is this like you're going to encompass every single event that you have is going to be put into like a a database that you can go and see how many instances there are a year, or how, how do we measure, I guess, how yeah, we're doing uh, it? We, we do enter that into our Web to School database, uh, and then I think we report out to the state annually uh, those exact figures. So uh, I would have to do some digging to look at some of those more specific questions, like what was the basis of those, uh, and are there trends that it's uh, one particular area of that uh, HHB spectrum um, that we would want to focus on? But those are certainly things that we'll be looking at as a leadership team when we kind of review the data and look at what do we want to do for next year. Uh, if we see trends or areas there um, that stick out, then we would want to focus that uh, on our universal um, intervention supports or some of our targeted uh, support to make sure that we're uh, addressing that. So, 
And then in addition, you'll get, you will start getting, I think it's in December, it's the first social emotional report. Yeah. Um, we track all office referrals on the database as well. Yeah, and I kind of, I kind of compare it to like a standardized testing scores. Is how, how do we yeah. rank? Like, do we have a problem? Do we not have a problem? Or what? Or what? It, what are the types of problems? And how can we better utilize our resources towards that? Yeah, um, that's another set of data that we've been trying to establish. <laughs> that's been a little disrupted with COVID and all yeah. the other things, but we're hopefully hoping to get a trend at some point. Yeah, no, it's good to, good to hear because we were at the last board meeting. We were talking. Or actually, I brought up about bullying and harassment and providing a safe and healthy environment for children to learn, right? And, you know, we have rashes of it and unfortunately I had to pick on Owen because it happens to be that age group of kids that, you know, between fifth grade and ninth grade, it tend to be the, the spike, right? Um, you know, and how, how do we combat that? And it's the beginning of the year, so how do we, like, really put our foot down and set the example for the year that this is what's not tolerated and yeah and, you know. and the approach that we have taken is really to lean in heavy with building a positive and supportive culture and I'll say that um, while there's more work that we need to do in creating an anonymous uh, an anonymous system of reporting we have a student body that is uh, I think feels empowered to come forward and report concerns uh, that has been my my experience in working with students and so as issues come up uh, we generally hear about them pretty quickly, and so I think that speaks to a lot of that work, as well as the, the trust that students have with the, the staff and the adults that they're working with on a regular basis. That was, may I add something? <clears throat> there are regulations we have to follow in timelines. So an example is we need to, when we have a report that's, that's reasonable, we have five days to complete that. So there, that's an example of many of the parts that we have. There's a lot of procedure in place that we must follow, which keeps us structured and honest about it. And um, we, also the definitions of things like bullying, harassment, and hazing are very specific. A lot of times in our culture, people talk about I was bullied. It's a very specific definition within a school system. And, and I think, you know, my experience with, you know, uh, an unfortunate situation that we had to deal with um, was I, I think the action at the administration level was was very good. And Can you say that one more time? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it's a little so, But I mean, I think yeah. at that level it was very good. I think the challenge was is you have you have this environment of you know <coughs> I'll call it smaller little harassment that right, turns into versions. bigger harassment and. And unfortunately, it has to wait to get to the big level. But <coughs> how do we take care of all that little stuff that we have testing at school? But if I can respond to that, I would say when we report out uh, in December, it sounds like on the social, emotional, and behavioral data, that's where you'll see those smaller trends. And we try to focus our uh, our supports, our social, emotional learning curriculums, uh, proactively to try to do. Uh, focus on some of those things, which is why you hear Andrew talking about our focus is respect uh, this month, and that's what we're working on. So, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, The only comment I would have would be to, if, if it's possible, to kind of share with parents kind of the, like what you're recommending for the students to do this so that if some, a student comes to a parent, they're able to say, well, you know, direct their kid how to respond. Mm -hmm. so, so I don't know if it's something for the newsletter or whatever. Absolutely, it does. No, I think I think maybe Owen had touched on it at the last meeting potentially about um, like these community events where you would have a topic yeah. change, so yeah, it might absolutely. be on bullying and harassment and how how to report it. I That's think right. we were talking about, and were we talking about maybe getting that back and going again uh -huh. or these series of events? So have so. group meetings, yeah, and meals. Say, well, food's though. always good, right? Yeah. We'll find a chef, right? Only if you yeah. have somebody that's yeah. members and hot dogs. Pizza. <laughs> Cookies. But I think yeah, that's a lot good, of times. Is how, how do we bring it community. to the attention yeah. Yeah. at the right time, right? Right. I mean, it does, doesn't just have to be parents. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Shane, and everybody. Um, we'll move on to the proposed board resolution thank regarding. You, LGBTQ identifying youth. Um, do we have this printed out? Any, I don't. Any 
in there? Okay. Um, Shannon, did you want to speak to this? So, sure. This was shared with the board. Um, and it is uh, LGBTQIA plus um, history month. Pride month is in June. And so in honor of that and with thoughts toward what has gone on in our community, um, our broader community, um, I wanted to bring a resolution to the board um, supporting our students who identify as LGBTQIA. So this has circulated. I think some of the highlights in the whereas, this is a three-page document. I'm not going to read it word for word. Um, but some of the highlights, um, certainly I've listed out, and this is based on NEA uh, model language. Um, so listed out the laws that are um, in place listed out that our values are respect, responsibility, safety, and kindness. Um, LGBTQ youth are four to six times more likely to attempt suicide than heterosexual youth and specifically, I'm sorry, and cisgender youth. And specifically, 41% of transgender youth report having attempted suicide at some point in their lives. And so I wanted to provide this resolution to let our students who identify this way know that their board supports them and supports, um, supports teachers and staff as well. So the first part of the resolution I think um, is the most important. Let it be resolved that the board declares the district to be a safe space for its students, meaning that the district is a place for students to learn, to thrive, and to seek assistance, information, and support free from discrimination and bullying. And then it goes on to reaffirm that we have policies in place prohibiting discrimination um, against all persons, students, family caregivers of a student or district employee on the basis of actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression, or the actual or perceived sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression of their associates. And um, there are very few action steps in here. I know that we do already, um, at the middle school level, at least last year, we had a GSA, um, a Gender and Sexuality Alliance, or Gay Straight Alliance, or it was, some, it was called a GSA, but something a little bit different in my time, so um, that we will continue to support those types of groups. That our district um, uh, dress code should be gender neutral, um, and that we will provide students with access to resources, um, and that we will designate October as LGBTQ History Month and June as Pride Month. It also resolves that the um, employees have academic freedom to discuss the resolution um, if they would like to, uh, as, as is age appropriate. Any other questions? The, um, well, the, the biggest question that I had, um, I happened to stop and uh, to see Jamie yesterday on a different issue, and and I had <coughs> asked him for a copy because I didn't. There wasn't a board copy for the resolution in the packet? It came out by a separate email. Uh, I didn't get any of it. And so Jamie had forwarded it to me yesterday. So I, I sent it to the whole board yesterday. Yeah, so I really didn't have the opportunity to look at it until today, and I haven't really had the opportunity to look at it in its thorough. But I guess some of the questions not have read it yet would, um, would just kind of be, you know, what does the resolution cover that already isn't state law and or school SU policy, I guess, was my first question. Haven't re read it yet. It's a resolution, not a new policy. No, so I didn't it's not say it covering any new ground. It's just reaffirming that we stand by these students okay. and that we have policies in place. Um. Does anybody, Rodney or Peggy, do you guys have comments? Have you had a chance to read it? I've really only 
certainly skimmed it over very quickly. I mean, I'm certainly in favor of the, the non-discrimination. I certainly believe in that. I think there was a, I think the only issue that I think it got into, again, I could say I only saw it brief, you know, skimmed it over, was the um, bathroom changing facilities as to how that works because I know that's a very sensitive issue for many people and how how we work around that I, I think that's that, that that that's the part that I find to be the most sensitive is as to how to work around that issue so Peggy I will say that um, when reviewing this and reviewing the model language I have been to both campuses I've used the facilities on both campuses as a female um, and so I talked to someone who had used them as a male who happens to live in my house so all of the things that are in this policy are I'm sorry all of the things that are in this resolution are things that are already just in place we have um, uh, I'm trying to find the language but it's it's there we have places for people to change that are private um, and we already support people using the facilities that they that match their gender identification it doesn't change any of that um, and it doesn't say we would we would provide anything that we're not already providing did you have any comments on it Rodney uh, <clears throat> Um, so, I guess, uh, have, do you have an opportunity to read it now? Or, I mean, are you willing to, I guess, what, what would the next step be? I guess the next step would be... Uh, make a motion make to a motion adopt the resolution. See, see as what ready. happens. I guess I uh, my recommendation right now is is having only received this late yesterday and I didn't have any time to look at it other than I'm looking at it now um, I think it would be unfair justice for me to vote for or against it not having the opportunity to look through this thoroughly um, just quickly glancing through some of the stuff I do have questions um, that I'd like to have the opportunity to um, study or find those answers myself if possible um is i mean is there an opportunity for us to adopt this at the next meeting or or, or go for a action item at the next meeting or um that's certainly a possibility um Shannon, what do you yeah think i think that, that given that people haven't read it thoroughly we should probably table it and okay. make sure everyone is fully in support of it before we adopt it I okay. think that makes a much stronger um, message to our staff, faculty, and students. Okay. That sounds good. So everybody read it um, and come prepared at the next meeting to discuss and take action. Okay. Thank you, Shannon. Um, would you mind holding your comment for the public comment time? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're, we're almost getting, there. Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> Only a few more things. All right, draft number one, student support budget, 23-24. Yeah, so this is uh, the student support budget, which makes up your administration, our student support personnel, school counselors, paraprofessionals, nurse, 
uh, admin assistants. Um, every our pathways coordinators we consider continue, consider as part of that support system sometimes as well. So they're in there. Also your activities director. Um, and so this is proposed budget one of student support. You'll get based on conversation tonight and as an administrative team that we meet. We're going to be looking at the rest of your teaching staff universally. And so sometimes that adjusts what this budget looks like as well for um, draft number two. So next month you'll get all your all, all of the bodies, which make up about 80% of your budget, presented into you via student support and all the, the rest of your universal instructors, which are your classroom teachers, it is um, your essential teachers, everyone else that's a licensed educator um, in the building. And so you'll see that. And then in December, you're going to get the third draft of this, second draft of everybody else, and as far as universal teaching staff, and all your maintenance and facilities, everything else, uh, broken out in function codes. The board will have an opportunity to give feedback then. Typically what that then results in is a special meeting in January, um, just focused on budget, and then we look for you in January to adopt a budget. Okay, so that's just to give you, again, the overall timeline. So the big changes tonight, um, as far as an FTE is, is that we did add a school counselor to have four school counselors this coming year. We are leveraging some grant funds to help cover that. We believe that that position is a position that we're gonna need moving forward. So we have two elementary counselors, a middle school counselor, that also serves the high school, a high school council that also helps support the middle school, 612. Um, that you're seeing budgeted locally with the idea being that that is a position that we want in the budget because we would need to keep that position definitely moving forward. And that's in addition to the counselors the, the mental health counselors who are here from Clara Martin. That's and in addition. I know we don't have one on the Bethel campus right now. How many are we supposed to have and how many do we currently so have in the district? We currently have, um, and those are not just funded through ESSER, by the way. Right, so right. you guys know that They're, those are funded by other grants that we receive, like Medicaid. Uh, we get something called MAC funds, which are used for social emotional health that, are, that we receive as an SU as well. And so those are two SAP, student assistance counselors, who do short-time therapeutic interventions and supports for students, either one-on-one -on -one or in small group. There's one of those budgeted for each campus, and a full-time school-based clinician through Claire Martin that can stu see students individually one-on-one. -on -one. Those positions are, when it says grant funding to remain the same on currently funded positions, those positions are all in there. Um, and so we're, we're moving forward with an SAP on each campus and a school-based clinician on each campus. Right now we are short a school-based clinician on the Bethel campus. Um, we're still uh, projecting six interventionists. Um, the, and that is continuing to be budgeted locally and um, through title funds, just so you know. So when it says grant funds remain the same, we're projecting the same revenue that offset some of that expense um, via title funds. And you will see the revenue budget um, start to line up with this in December, by the way. The, but right now we're gonna continue to support it the same percentage in revenue around uh, title for intervention. The guidance we just talked about, nurses would remain the same at two. You'll see regular Ed Paris have bumped up by three FTE. We are seeing some more intensive needs around behavioral supports um, needed for some of our students. And what we're doing is we have a contracted um, behavioral support person uh, through Claire Martin, that's a board certified behavioral analyst. His name's Christian McCrory, he writes behavioral plans. And then we have paraprofessionals that can help support the implementation of those behavioral plans. And what that results in, though, is that we need, instead of us going and contracting out a behavioral interventionist through Claire Martin, we're hiring our own paras and training our own paras up. So we have some students that in the past 
may have needed placements in alternative programs, oh, by the way, which are full right now. So I will tell you that um, an out-of-district placements typically, just to remind the board, cost a, anywhere from 80000 to upwards of 120000 per student. Um, what we're actually finding right now, not just our supervisory union, but regionally, is that the out-of-district placement type therapeutic placement schools that we would typically refer a student to are full. Um, what school districts are now being told is if you have a student that you think may need an out-of-district placement, you need to get on the wait list for next year. Um, and so as we continue to invest in our own alternative programming and also trying to beef up the supports we can have here, students are entitled to FAPE, free and appropriate education. So part of that's resulting in us needing more of our own paras that we train up to implement intensive behavioral plans. And so that's the bump there. Um, the subs was reduced to get us more in alignment with actuals of what the um, current subs have been costing us um, across RUD. And we had budgeted higher based on COVID. Um, our expectation, and we're hopeful that we're gonna see that need for subs to decrease. Um, and then you get your three student support coordinators um, within the budget, your athletic activities director in the budget, and then your two pathways coordinators are in the budget. And some of that change in salary there is FTE, benefits, things of that nature. Um, would that also explain why the one extra FTE is 157000 for the guidance? Well, that is not just one staff. That's that is negotiated increases for all four staff right. and taking in benefits. And a reminder that family benefits are right around $23,000 for an FT. So that's, remember, all salary and benefits are in these lines, not just salary. Right, right, but yeah. Okay. And then earlier you had said that <clears throat> the extra full-time um, counselor, there was grant funding tied to that, and I guess well, one part is that's great that we're getting another counselor that we desperately need, but how do we backfill that revenue when the grant may not be there in year three? That's why five? we're looking to budget locally. Because um, that's always the, you know, we create a position based on grants, and then a couple years later it's not there, and then we have to come up with the money ourselves. And then I, I'd asked you the, I'm going to put you on the spot, but they had the, um, so increases wise, and I know there's a comp complicated formula at the, education to figure out what one penny on the tax rate means versus an increase of a budget, but could maybe you get that to me on what? I can definitely get it to you. It's gonna be old ballpark off last yeah. year because what goes into account of that is the yield, which we don't know yet, right. and our equalized pupils is what makes it challenging. It's a ballpark of around $70,000. That's about what it's been. $70,000 yeah. per penny, okay. 70 to, yeah, it was 72 maybe one year. It's okay. been somewhere in there. It's just nice to know those things when you're for in this district. For, budget for an example, building. in some of my smaller districts, a penny can be nineteen thousand. Um, are you looking to do that hiring of paras to avoid out of district placements SU wide? Each district has a different need. Yeah, I mean, no, we're trying to build up our own our own bench and staff. Um, I would also say the intensity of need, and the principals can speak to this better than I can because they're in uh, they're on the front lines every day I would say our K through three population have really suffered from COVID right. um, and our their ability to have the social skills and the early intervention at pre-k for us to be able to head off some of the concerns that have gotten bigger now in first and second grade and or kindergarten um, has been uh, a significant concern. And we try to fade paras by middle school. The goal, and, if, and, and you see that in your buildings and you see that in all my buildings, most of our paraprofessional staff are deployed at the elementary level to implement behavioral plans. By the time students get to middle and high school, we're looking for them to be independent, right? Like we put an intervention plan in place, we support the student, and then we try to fade the plan off, the student off from that intensive need of a one-on-one -on -one or a two, two students on one adult. Um, what we're finding is, is that the need at those really early primary levels is significant. 
Um, yeah. Well, I, I fully support. Doing and why you're seeing in regular ed, by the way, is um, one special ed law changed. Yeah. And so, um, typically, you would see these paras budgeted at special ed level at the SU level around FTEs, but. In regards to, and I've been talking about this at the SU level, the changes to special education law is that you need to put early interventions and supports in place first before a, a school team could even consider specialized um, instruction or programming. So one of the questions and criteria we have to meet for the state now is, did you put a level of intervention in like a behavioral intervention plan for a student? implement it with other academic interventions and accommodations before we can even talk about would the student qualify for special education okay. yeah i guess my question with the so part of that increase at the local level too is us understanding that some of those supports where we would just go move to a special ed referral and a student may qualify for an iep and part of that iep intensive plan may be to receive paraprofessional support is something that we need to be providing sooner, which I believe in, by the way. I, I hope, I'm not saying that I don't, I think early interventions we're at, I think we should be providing early intervention for students. Um, it's just in the past, those positions, maybe you'd be seeing at the SU level, those bumped up by three, where you won't be seeing that significant of a bump up in paras and special ed um, support right now. It, it, it's tending to be more at the local level. Would you agree about the early intervention and, and the yes. need? Yeah. Um, any other questions for Jamie or comments on the student support budget? All right, thank you. Go to the next part next month. Okay. E yeah, that percentage should get lower. Yeah, I, I would hope so. Yeah. <laughs> EI update on summer 2023 heating HVAC and lighting update. Yeah, so I was with um, EI this evening. Actually, they did a uh, significant presentation down at Sharing tonight about a proposed possible expansion project. Um, so EI is going to be with us in November. Right now, Tara is working with EI to solidify all of the ESSER funding that we're putting toward this project. And what I mean by solidifying is anytime we want to use ESSER funds, for anything to do with building upgrades, the AOE needs to give us prior pr approval on each individual project. What I mean is not we're going to use ESSER funding to help um, provide better air quality for the Royalton campus. They want to know what, what are you doing, like what air handlers are you replacing. They want specifics. And so right now EI and Tara are working hand in hand to get all those prior approvals so that when we come to you, in November, and we say we have this amount of ESSER revenue, it's already been certified by prior approval. So that's the work we're doing right now. The um, other grants that we talked to you about that came in around wood chip pellets um, and grants to offset, in addition to ESSER, to offset some of the work we want to do around fresh air, those have been, we've been given the green light on those, so we're feeling really good about that revenue that we showed you. Uh, is really the ESSER revenue now that we're securing. And so in November, he's going to come into you with you, Eric, about detailed figures, detailed revenue. The hope is that it continues to move in the right direction, uh, meaning not added costs for uh, us as a district. And then I would say as a district, you'll need to make a decision November, no later than the December, to say, yes, let's move forward. A reminder, and the public didn't hear this, so I'm saying it for this to them too, the plan is to do um, a whole new heating system, HVAC lighting at Bethel, and redo some of the controls here and new lighting on this campus at no increase rate for the taxpayer. <coughs> and so I think that's a really exciting thing. It's uh, something that I think we should be really proud about. In addition to that, starting next month, I know that the music boosters, this is something we had talked about last year, was this idea of an expansion to this campus to better support performing arts. EI is now involved with the architect, Banwell, on that. That's who's partnering at Sharon. And so EI is going to be working with Banwell 
and that group around the expansion of a performing arts lab to come in front of the board with just preliminary drawings and <coughs> figures um, in December. With the concept being in that the board would continue to explore that if there's a desire by the board to do that. Not in that they, we wouldn't be moving forward on any work on that until the following summer, right? So this coming summer is phase one, new, new boiler, new HVAC, new lighting, um, this coming summer, and then the board can consider that expansion project as possibly a phase two, um, and, but that wouldn't come in front of the board until December. <clears throat> so those are the EI updates I have. Okay. Can you please thank Tara for us? I'm sure that all of this nitty gritty is not something she expected <laughs> to have to become an expert in. Um, sort of like when she had to go take food service classes. So. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, uh, federal grants are great, uh, right? It's bringing revenue and we're able to right. accomplish some things that we typically wouldn't. The uh, capacity and strain on um, the folks that deal with grants and finances increase uh, significantly yeah, when you're increase. using federal money and state money. So, well, I guess one, would we have to have another single audit for the, for those projects, being mm -hmm. that they're going to be federally funded? So know? it's part, the, that single audit that we had this year was on ESSER 2. Mm -hmm. We're using ESSER 3 funds. Okay. They will do a single audit on our auditors next year on ESSER 3. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And um, we'll just probably want to make sure we have it budgeted for extra auditing or whatever. Sure. Whoever, I don't know if that's our level, your level, or what. <laughs> um, and yeah, so it sounds like the, at the December meeting we'll have information. So we're the phase November one. November meeting, you'll have phase one information right. details. Um, and maybe in the December going forward, I just want to make sure going into our, you know, uh, Townwide meeting, school board, school meeting, that will have information about what we're planning so that we can absolutely have, have for you mean phase two? Yeah. Yeah, we would have solid information in whatever direction you want to go for phase two so by <coughs> March. Because yeah, have, having the ability to say what we want to do with our surplus funds. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, we've already discussed the action items so any new hires resignations you know we have a couple of pair of resignations but they're at the su level okay then we're on to public comments again okay um yeah go ahead sure um so andrew as the chair of the board i'm going to just speak to you briefly I noticed when I handed out the packet that you didn't have a chance to review any of the attachments that I sent. I shared them, I shared them with the newspaper, with the, the Randolph Valley Herald, and I shared them with the Valley News. I'm going to read a couple aloud because I think it's important that you do know what they consist of. It's important that you do review them. And um, so one of them says, oh, Jude, I couldn't imagine these. Let me clarify. These are on the public Royalton Forum. Oh, Jude, I couldn't imagine anyone has as much happiness in their life as, as I do. Great kids, supportive and loving family, wonderful friends, my life is full of blessings. You, however, are obviously a miserable, lonely old trumper who is so bored with his insignificant life and jealous of mine that his only joy is posting crap to the town forum to try to piss people off. It's pathetic. And the populations that you target have your number. Go poke someone else for a while. I've got books to read and a weekend with people I love to get back to. If you'd like to speak to me again, this part's important, you can do so at the public board meetings. You won't be effective in changing anything, but stop in anyway. You can see what the grown-ups do while we're actually working on building community instead of tearing it apart. So that was addressed to a member of the community who originally posted um, about the concerns going on in the schools right now. Another one says, Jude, I think public school curriculum is created at a level way past your pay grade, Jude. And if you don't like it, you can move your kids to private school. Oh yeah, you don't have kids in the system anymore. You are just spitting into the wind and trying to rile up a population who has not seen fit to hop on and help you out here. Where are all the angry parents, Jude? 
the list and the posts go on and on. And we've sat here and we've listened to we the so yeah. We've listened to the social media policy and how it doesn't affect or apply to members of the board. But I can assure you, as a realtor who sells property in the area to parents moving into the area and sending their kids to this school, that when a school board member speaks like that about our school and our community and speaks to and addresses members of our community that way, it is not going to bring folks to our community. It is not going to make them want to send their kids to our school. And it is not going to bring the community together. So I am asking you, as the chair of the board, if you choose not to address anything and do anything now, we're not going to drop this. So what do we do as concerned parents? Um, to respond, I mean, I certainly you can express your opinions with your votes. Like, if you don't like a board member, you... It's not about not liking a board member. Well, right. It so, not, has nothing to do with that. I, exactly. I certainly hear your concerns about, you know, how people express themselves, but you don't deserve to be on the board. Um, that you can certainly behavior. bring your bring, keep bringing it up in public session if it, it remains a concern for you. Um, you know, I. I'm oh. asking that the board vote that you hold a special vote or a special discussion, and you review the material that I provided to you, and you discuss it and you take it into consideration, and you think of how it affects our community, and our kids, and the sensitive subjects that are, that are at hand right now okay. with our school and our surrounding communities. Thank you. Thank you. Is there other public comments at this time? And we talk about respect, okay, for our children that need to be respectful. How can they be respectful when they don't have respect running the show. You know, Shannon, you should be ashamed of yourself. I know you just want to smile at me. Okay. Is there anybody else who would like to make a comment? Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Can you state your name, by the way? Oh, sorry. My name is Jason. Jason. Christy Bowman. Um, I wanted to hop back to flag policy, um, sure. offer some comments there. Um, I apologize for being a little late to the discussion. This is new to me. So I ask this in genuine intent. Why do we need a flag policy? I would recommend, if it is possible, that an American and a state flag be where it stops personal opinion. It seems a little unnecessary. Um, some of the discussion that I heard tonight on the flag policy seemed to give the students a little bit too much power. There's been a lot of this flag discussion going on at the school that I'm aware of, and there was a pretty considered amount of pressure put on some middle schoolers with petitions that went around to choose different flags that were being put out there. Let's just stop it with the American and the state flag. Personal opinion. I don't know the history of why it evolved, and I take responsibility for not being aware of that, but that's an opinion I'd like to share with you. There was petitions going around, you know. I don't know the true definitions um, that were provided for <coughs> hazing and harassment and bullying, but there was certainly pressure. Um, to participate in that when it happened, you know, in the last few months. A lot, in, a lot of it I heard in my household as well. Um, jump a subject, if that's okay. Um, sure, but keep it brief just so that everybody Okay, yep. Um, I appreciate the fact that you're giving yourselves um, additional time on the resolution. Um, on the LGBTQIA plus policy, but if it is a resolution of support, it seems unnecessary to me. If the place, if it's already covered somewhere else. The other question, and I don't know if someone has an answer about that, I've heard a couple of comments about that it's already state law. I would love it if someone could take an action item, I'm not sure who it's appropriate for, and let me know what state law that is. 
I did a little bit of review on my own today, and I found that there are um, best practices out there, but I didn't see anything that referred to statute. I'm just not aware of it, so I don't know if that's something that possible that someone could take an action item and let me know what this, what state policies are out there. My current senator was not aware of any. Okay. So. I, I can respond to that real quick. Great. Um, so there are two kind of main laws that we have. One is the kind of anti-discrimination side of things where we're not allowed to, you know, discriminate against the student from participating in activities based on gender or orientation or any of that stuff. Yep. Um, the other side of it is the right to privacy. So the school shouldn't be the one who outs a student, essentially. So if a student is transgender and they have not revealed that to other people, the school can't make a policy that forces them to reveal their okay. you know, biological sex or whatever. Are those so that means law we can't have, or are those guidelines? I mean, that's the... Those are laws. Um, so. Okay, I just yeah. I didn't know if someone knew the VSA Act number, so I could look at it. Uh, okay. it's, that one is the, the federal um, family. What's the FERPA? Um, Title Nine protects. Uh, yeah. Plans. Title. T I see. St I see Title Nine. I just see a lot of the other stuff that was more general uh -huh. policy when I looked it up, <laughs> and I would encourage us to not be strong armed by. Sure. state's policy and look into that on an individual basis and I think a lot of that policy gives us that <coughs> leniency okay thank you um, I would add too um, the public accommodate Vermont public accommodation law is the overarching policy governing the, the controversy around transgender use of the bathrooms there's nothing the board uh, again obviously the board has its own attorneys but you cannot require a transgender student or adult to use a bathroom that disagrees with their identified gender, Vermont law. Um, you know, whether the Board of Education or the school boards have power to change that, uh, it's a decision someone has to make, I guess. Uh, can you state your name again? James Gothier. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? I was just going to say that I, I want to remind you that I'm coming from a place of good intention. And I think that it's clear with us parents being here that we're just we're not informed about this stuff and so for a resolution to be brought here and for members of the board to say I skimmed it I skimmed it and then a member of the board to say what I, I propose that we adopt this resolution so there are members in our community who are not informed about this stuff wouldn't the, the right thing to do be to hold a public forum before litigation and further ridicule about our school or our town I mean it just seems like we could be proactive and provide information that is not one-sided and not name-calling and answer questions that parents have thank you thank you um, sorry. and also I think a lot of the reason a lot of us is here is because of that purpose of the the bathroom deal um, and uh, I don't think that uh, a, a lot of these young girls in the bathrooms would appreciate going in and, and having to look at somebody's penis. That is not happening. It's just What's, not. What's, uh, I mean, I, when that's, you go change clothes, you go in the locker room, that's if, what happens. <laughs> I know. Parents need to be just informed. Sure. It's a sensitive subject. We can't be met with hatred right. and name -calling. No. Okay, are there anybody online who has any comments they'd like to provide? Okay. How many folks are online, Rex? It's asking for trouble. Yep, let's go. 22? Nice. 20. No, that's Okay. One more comment in the back. Thank you, um, Penny Griffin. I just have a comment. All through school, I played every sport I could, and walking into a locker room and changing in the public with multiple girls was uncomfortable. Saying nothing about the other side being in there as well. It's, it's the way it is. I don't know. I think. Um, 
allowing them, they want to change in the girls' locker room, fine, but not at the same time as the rest of the girls. It's, it's, you're asking for trouble. Nobody should be put in that position. These kids should not be put in that position. You need to protect the kids. Changing, fine. Do it separately. Go in and change, then the rest go in, or vice versa. Don't make it a joint thing. It's, it's wrong. I can't believe we're here for this. But this has already been passed. And that's, that's why we're here, because it's been passed, and resolutions continue to be passed, and we're not informed. So and we are not informed. But the comments that were made were that it's our fault, and we don't care, and that's right. why we're not informed. That's what we're here to clarify. We do okay. care. We want to be informed. If, okay. if nothing is done about this, mm -hmm. there's other people here that should be ashamed of themselves, okay. too. Thank you. And, and it will get worse, I'm afraid. It will get um, worse. Is there anybody else who would like to make a comment? And I feel like right now you're shutting us out. Uh, we're, giving sorry, everybody, we're giving you know, everybody we a chance to speak. We sat here and waited and waited. And now why can't we speak? You He's giving are giving, I, I've given you an opportunity to speak. It was your turn to speak. And then other people started speaking. You all so. speak together to one another. Just the way that the public forum speak. works is in order for it to be orderly. Right. right. Do it in a certain way. Okay. And everybody gets a chance to speak. And you know, we have time limits so that everybody has an opportunity. And I'm trying to let everybody things just mind. happen to come up as things go on is sure. just the problem. Sure. You have try to understand. And, that. Try and be as flexible as we can. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for I do appreciate everybody coming out. It's nice to see people getting involved, and you know, we would love to see we participation hate to have all to get our involved. board meetings about things. So, um, I would like to say something really quick. <coughs> sure. Um, I do. let my 14-year-old son read some of those, and um, his comment was, "They tell us to act our age. Why don't they?" So I just wanted to add that. Right yeah, if that had a kid's name associated with it, we'd be seeing a lot of counselors and a lot of disciplinary action. Yeah. <laughs> if it had my daughter's own name on it, I'd have been hearing from you guys. Rightfully so. Yeah. There needs to be consequences. Okay. Um, are there any final comments? Thank you, everybody. We're going to be um, moving into executive session. Um, next so i think the public portion of the meeting is is finished thank you thank you uh, thank you for coming <laughs> so the executive session, I think we will have a slide in for presentation okay. by then and really just need to go through it. So, um, yeah, we'll need a motion to enter an executive session inviting Jamie, the union representatives. Um, could the union representatives identify themselves so that we know who to invite into the executive session? I think it's... Uh, Hi, my name is Chris Ramsey. I'll be one of the union representatives. Okay. And Sam Diamond. And then Sam Diamond. I'm the union grievance chair. Okay. I missed it's going to take a couple minutes to get fired up, or are we going to be able to go like <coughs> immediately? Try and think if I can run the bathroom. I'm going to go ahead Well, why don't, why don't we make an exec, a motion to go into executive session first and then. Yeah, I would make a motion to go into executive session you, you at. Just, sorry. 844. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. We now get, invite in Jamie, Andra. I'll be inviting Jamie, Sam Andra, Dumas. and the union representatives. Second. Okay. Thank you. One more time. Uh, motion to return to public session with no action taken at 935. Second. Okay. Um, moving through our rest of our agenda, um, future agenda items, we have the LGBTQ plus resolution um, mm -hmm. for next month. Um, and then I think that's the only Yep. One more important thing today. On well, update to the flag policy, but we will. Right, those are kind of our. Yep. Um, 
next meeting date, Tuesday, November 15th, 6.30 p.m. at the Bethel campus. Um, and then you can entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved.